Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this lecture on Thomas Gray and his elegy, elegy written in the country churchyard, we will begin with a historical and literary context, discuss Gray's uh, life with reference to a few key points, then discuss the number of graveyard poets who were able to form a movement called Graveyard School of Poetry, discuss the selected passages from the elegy written in a country churchyard. We also have a syntactical reading focusing on the sentence structure used in this poem to deal with the theme of death. And finally, we will have a post structuralist reading which tells about the self-referentiality within this poem. A few key points we can recall in the context of Gray's writing. Robert Walpole was the first Prime Minister of England under two kings, King George I and King George II. Robert Walpole was a very astute politician and businessman he was able to manage many different kinds of political situations and he was the father of Horace Walpole, a close friend of Thomas Gray and Walpole was incidentally a pioneer of the Gothic novel which also has something to do with this graveyard school of poetry and pre-romantic movement in writing in England at that time. Many writers were able to survive with the good will of Robert Walpole and Lord Harvey. In this difficult time, Alexander Pope survived despite the presence of Walpole and Harvey, but Gray had no such interest in the politics of survival. In fact, he refused the poet laureateship when it was offered to him and also re rejected the demand for some public lectures. He went on to reflect profoundly about the human condition because of the many deaths in his own family. Thomas Gray by nature was a withdrawn and melancholic person. He was thinking about life deeply because of the many deaths in his own family. However, he pursued higher studies and received a degree in law, though he did not become a lawyer and practice it. He loved writing, so he wrote in Latin, translated from Latin, he wrote in English. He was contemplating about life, so he was more of a poet of contemplation than of action. He was able to get recognition widely because of his friend Horace Walpole who sent the manuscript to different groups circles in London. Gray was a close friend of Robert West and also William Mason. West unfortunately died and in fact he was one of the reasons for writing this elegy written in a country churchyard. Later on William Mason was publishing all the poems of Thomas Gray. Gray was known for a few poems like the progress of poesy and the bard, but primarily he was known for this elegy written in a country churchyard. Who are these graveyard poets? What did they do? This graveyard school of poetry was a serious phenomenon of the late 18th century. The poets of this group had their setting in a graveyard or a church death and loss were the prominent themes in their poems. They were highly introspective and meditative and as a group they became 
the precursors for romantic poetry in 19th century. We have a number of prominent poets and their poems of all these grace elegy written in a country churchyard stands apart. We have Thomas Parnell's A Night Peace on Death, Robert Blair's The Grave, Edward Young's Night Thoughts. We have two quotations Young's poetry one says read nature, nature is a friend to truth. And the second one goes like this, we are all born originals. Originality will become a key theme of the romantic poetry unlike the neoclassicals who spent more time for reading the Greeks and Latins and uh, imitated them. When we come to this poem elegy written in a country churchyard, we understand that this is one of the greatest memorial poems in English literature. There are two versions actually, one is called the Eton manuscript and the 1751 manuscript. The first one had this title stanzas wrote in a churchyard and the second one had this title elegy written in a country churchyard. Whether first version or second version, this is not exactly an elegy. It is an elegy with a difference, it is more like an ode. It is more reflective and meditative. It has its setting in a rural village and it deals with poor and illiterate people. One of the most famous lines from this poem is the paths of glory lead but to the grave. This line is a meditation at its best about life and death. We have something more to learn about the elegy. There are 32 stanzas of 4 lines each, totally making up 128 lines. The poem as such has 29 stanzas that is 116 lines. At the end of the poem, we have an epitaph. It consists of 3 stanzas and that means 12 lines. The entire poem is in the form of quatrains with this rhyme scheme A B A B. Because of this structure, this stanza is known as elegiac stanza. As we mentioned earlier, the major theme of this poem is theme of death, but it is not exactly of desolation. There is some consolation that immortality will be there for the poet, some kind of continuity will be there. According to Dr. Johnson, the poem finds an echo in every bosom. Everyone can be connected with this poem as it deals with the common theme of death that all of us will have to face. The tone of melancholy claims that we ought to accept the injustice of society as we do inevitability of death. That is what William Emson says about this famous elegy. We have some selected passages now. We will begin with stanza 1 and 2 and continue reading and then do some analysis. The curfew tolls a knell of parting day, the lowing herd winds slowly over the lee, the plowman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades a glimmering landscape on the sight and all the air a solemn stillness holds, save where the beetle wheels his droning flight and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. Some underlining like this we have done for day and way to indicate the kind of rhyme that this poem has. The first stanza is very famous for the exact typical iambic pentameter that we have in English literature. It also has many other complications, many critics have pointed out the different kinds of difficulties, the challenges this particular poem poses. Next stanza 3 and 4. Save that from yonder ivy mantle tower, the mopping owl does to the moon complain of such as wandering near her secret bower, molest her ancient solitary reign. Beneath those rugged elms that yew trees shade, where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap, each in his narrow cell for ever laid the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. Now we can see that the setting is the graveyard, the rude forefathers, the ancient forefathers that is the unlettered, unsophisticated people of the village, they all lie in the graveyard. 
The breezy call of incense breathing morn, the swallows twittering from the straw built shed, the cock's shrill clarion or the echoing horn, no more shall rouse them from their lowly bed. For them no more the blazing hearth shall burn, of busy housewife ply her evening care, no children run to lisp their sire's return or climb his knees that envied kiss to share. Here again we have indicated some kind of assonance and alliteration in the first two lines breezy and breathing assonance and swallow straw shed indicating this alliteration lowly bed referring to some kind of transferred epithet having lot of ambiguity within this bed which lies below the earth or bed that belongs to people from the lower uh, strata of the society. Of did the harvest to their sickle yield, their furrow of the stubborn glove has broke. How jocund did they drive their team afield, how bowed the woods beneath their sturdy stroke. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure, nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile, the short and simple annals of the poor. Obviously, the poet is concerned with the history of the poor people who are normally neglected by the mainstream of the society. These people may not have ambition, they may not have something grandeur that we find in other places particularly in towns and cities, but they have their own way of life, sweet life. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power and all that beauty, all that wealth they ever gave awaits alike the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave, that is where Thomas Gray makes this comparison between rural people and urban people or rich people and poor people saying all will have all kinds of glories, but all of them will have one place that is grave. The grave does not make any distinctions between glories of the poor or the rich. Nor you proud impute to these the fault in memory over the tomb no trophies raise where through the long drawn aisle and fretted vault the peeling anthem swells a note of praise. One of the most important points about this poem we have to remember is Gray is talking about the neglected talents of the village people. Perhaps in this neglected spot is laid some heart once pregnant with celestial fire hence that the rod of empire might have swayed or waked to ecstasy the living liar. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark and fathomed caves of ocean bear, full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Some villagers may have had extraordinary talents to rule this empire. England was expanding its uh, rule all over the world, he has this imperial rule at the back of his mind and also some of them could become great poets, living liar. They could sing poems, but these people uh, are not recognized or they did not get this kind of opportunity that people may get in uh, towns and cities. This poet who is thinking about this passing of time and the people being dead and buried and thinking about his own life and death. He believes that some kind of kindred spirit will continue his own uh, life that is remembrance of his own life. Now this poet having come from town he is in this uh, village and he is talking about thinking about these people and somebody else would come after him and think about him and write about him in some poem or other. So he says for thee who mindful of the honored dead does in these lines their artless tale relate, if chance by lonely contemplation led, some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate. Haply some hoary headed swine may say, oft have we seen him at the peep of dawn, brushing with hasty steps the dew away, to meet the sun upon the upland lawn. This poet is now moving around this village and somebody, some hoary headed swine, some shepherd or rustic person would say one day that there was a person moving around in this uh, town or in, the, in this place. The swine may say further like this, one morn I missed him on the customed hill along the heath and near his favorite tree, another came nor yet beside the rill nor up the lawn nor at the wood was he. 
the next with the dirges due in sad array slow through the churchway path we saw him borne approach and read for thou canst read the lay graved on the stone beneath yon aged thorn this is a kind of dirge the song of sorrow that the hoary swine or the rustic may sing about this person who has disappeared who has who is dead who is no more what is interesting about this poem is the poem ends with an epitaph the hoary swine may say something like this this may be written and uh, inscribed on the stone here rests his head upon the lap of the earth a youth to fortune and to fame unknown fair signs frowned not on his humble birth and melancholy marked him for her own large was his bounty and his soul sincere heaven did a recompense as largely send he gave to his misery all he had a tear he gained from heaven it was all he wished a friend now for their sake his merits to disclose or draw his frailties from their dread abode there they alike in trembling hope repose the bosom of his father and his god there are 12 lines in this epitaph we have indicated the line numbers for each stanza obviously we can see that melancholy and misery these two words dominate this epitaph which stands for the poet who was passing by this village as usual we will attempt a thematic contrast in this poem a number of contrasts can be noted life death morning evening refined rude village city home graveyard husband wife parents children sowing and harvesting joy and sorrow poor and rich ambition and apathy glory and shame dualities or binaries like this we can further see memory and forgetfulness realized and unrealized talent serenity and restlessness freedom and tyranny virtue and vice truth and falsehood loneliness and community educated and uneducated or unlettered fortune and misfortune loss and gain most importantly melancholy and sanguinity melancholy refers to the sad contemplative mood of the poet and this sanguinity indicates the opposite of melancholy that is some kind of optimistic feeling that he also will be remembered by other people of the village or somebody like him somebody will pass by and write about him in some lines as this poet has done there is also an inbuilt thematic contrast between uh, two forms of poetry one is elegy and what is the rest find out this is an exercise for you we can observe a number of poetic devices in this poem how does thomas gray communicate his serious thoughts about the theme of death in this elegiac poem first we begin with transferred epithet his weary way the way itself is not weary but who is walking tired it refers to the person who is walking tired almost like zumag we have one line and leaves the world to darkness and to me critics have noted that this is the only place where we have this personal pronoun me in all other places we don't have it's more about objective kind of discussion on whatever is there in the village hyperbaton is inversion as you know and all the year a solemn stillness holds this is again a problematic sentence sentence structure it has and many critics have noted we will uh, come to it when we do a reading of this poem critical reading of this poem a little later the this poem is actually written in english but it uses latin syntax in which words can be placed anywhere but in english if you place words in different places because of word order meanings will differ we have an example of anomotopy drowsy tinklings the drowsiness drowsiness and the tinkling sound are together brought in here we have the metaphor of cell and sleep even sleep standing for death that is uh, going up to the level of symbol we have many personifications like ambition and grandeur even this whole idea of melancholy itself is personified in this poem 
we have this alliteration many examples are there just we have one here in line number 33 the pomp of power. We have the case of anaphora in one line and all that beauty and all that wealth gave and the most important line we said is this, this is epigrammatic the paths of glory lead but to the grave. When we read a poem like this at least one or two lines we can remember this is one memorable poem, this is one memorable line from a memorial poem or a memorable poem from Thomas Gray. We have further personification in knowledge and penury. There is also an interesting allusion to the civil wars in England during this Cromwell period there was one Hamden who died for freedom opposing the king he did not want to pay tax and similarly Milton was participating in the civil war taking the side of Cromwell and this whole civil war was led by this Oliver Cromwell. Some people like this from the villages from different places may have come up but they did not get a chance to grow that is for the society to, to think about. We have more number of rhetorical devices or poetic devices in this poem. We have a stanza full of questions and they are in fact rhetorical questions. Can storied urn or animated burst back to its mansion called the fleeting breath? Can honors voice provoke the silent dust or flattery soothe the dull cold ear of death? Answer is of course no. We have metaphor ambiguity and paradox in these lines. Full many a germ of purest ray serene the dark and fathom the caves of ocean bear full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air we have this gem, we have this flower, we have this connection between gem and ocean, caves of ocean, unfathomed caves of ocean, dark ocean and we also have this flower born to blush but unseen that is the villager who is born and dead here, he is not at all seen glowing or becoming a person of greatness with some opportunity for realizing his or her own talent. We also have this metonymy, the entire rustic land or rural land stands for the people of this rural area and the last one is personification, fair signs and melancholy. The poet is able to use many of these devices to drive home the point that uh, death is something uh, which does not differentiate between urban and rural people, poor or rich people. What we can do in this life is to find some way to realize our own talents. If there is a possibility then we should do it. We, now we will look into this rhyme rhythm and meter. As we already indicated this poem has his rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B uh, with alternating rhymes in all 32 stanzas the tone of this poem is sober and melancholic. This is a poem that gives the best example of iambic pentameter. First stanza is often discussed in critical studies, but we have chosen the third stanza here and indicated how the metrical analysis is done. Save that from yonder ivy mantle tower the moping owl does to the moon complain of such as wandering near her secret bower molest her ancient solitary reign. We indicate the metrical pattern through these uh, lines that we have indicated. N next we are able to see the enjambment here from tower in the first line to the moping and similarly from complain of such we are able to see that. At the end of this stanza we have this full stop that means the line ends there. So all the three variation all the three examples we have in this stanza. We also notice a variation in this metrical pattern that is uh, uh, measure or meter in addition to this I am dominant iambic meter we have this trochee and also pyrrhic in examples like save that and dash too. In the case of trochee we find 
the stressed syllable comes in the first word save and in the case of Peric there is no stress. Here is a passage for us to do this analysis. This we are not doing, but it will be good for you to do that on your own as we did in the previous slide. You can read it and count the number of syllables and draw the line like this vertical line like this and see the number of syllables. Every line will have 10 syllables and there will be one unstressed syllable, another stressed one normally iambic, the some variation may be there, you can do it yourself. Now, let us move to this syntactical reading offered by Hutchings. This elegy is an English poem, but it uses Latin syntax and causes confusion for the reader. Such kind of syntactical difficulty we would find in Milton as well or any poet who is deeply influenced by Latin grammar or Latin language. The major problem in this poem is the loss of distinction between the subject and the object in the sentence structure. If you do not maintain that word order properly, then which is a subject, which is the object we will not know. So, this subject and object they are collapsed because of this ambiguous word order. Similarly, some verbs are used in different ways. In this case, we have an example talls in the first line, is it used transitively or intransitively both meanings could be derived that is what critics have attempted. Similarly, the whole stanza can be rearranged, possibility of rearranging lines in the very first stanza many critics have pointed out. Further, we find problems with the part of speech whether the word is singular or plural for example, heard we, we have some difficulty. So, with all these difficulties, syntactic, lexical, verbal difficulties, the poem poses extraordinary difficulty causing or leading to instability in the poem and Hutchings calls it fluid syntax and his claims that is this fluid syntax is a key to understanding Gray's elegy. One example that he gives is this and all the year a solemn stillness holds. We use this as an example of inversion and all the year a solemn stillness holds, it could uh, be like this rearranged like this and a solemn stillness holds all the year and it could be rearranged in some other way depending on somebody's uh, critical viewpoint. What this whole poem is about death, how do we achieve death in, in the poem itself that is what is something interesting many critics have observed. Death means turning the subject into object and death is certain, but we are uncertain about it that is the beauty of this poem and also of our life. We have a post structuralist reading from a critic called Bygrave. He begins giving the two common readings normally readers have towards this poem. First, the poem becomes the epitaph it claims to become. The whole poem of 29 stanzas attempt to become this epitaph that is one reading. Another reading is the poem dramatizes the Augustan ideal under stress incapable of being extended to accommodate certain forms of personal rather than common or social experience. We saw in the case of Dryden and Pope more of social experience is brought into their poems that is where we saw Pope was able to accommodate some personal experiences, but when we come to pre-romantic poetry we find more efforts to bring in the personal. This particular poem dramatizes the conflict between the two and then Bygrave offers a post structuralist reading. Gray unable to belong to the city comes to Stokes page that is a village, but then he is an outsider here though he glorifies the rustic environment. What we find in Gray is that he is not able to belong to the town nor to the village. So, he has to find a way of establishing himself through this achievement of immortality. Gray promises immortality but he denies it paradoxically because he dies and then 
whether somebody would come and memorialize him as well. Gray is implicated in his own irony and his elegy is a paradigm of the romantic conversation poem. We find that the poet talks to himself and then there is a speech from this hoary swine. So, this conversation also takes place between the reader and the writer and the character that is brought into the poem and many other voices are brought into the poem, villagers, people from town, the civil war heroes and many others. To summarize, we saw the historical and literary context in which Thomas Gray was writing the period of King George II. There was a movement called the Graveyard School of Poetry to which Gray also belonged because most of them were writing about graveyard and the theme of death. This poem elegy written in a country churchyard is an example of this graveyard school of poetry and also this is an exemplary poem for this elegiac uh, tone if not elegiac form actually that is why we say that this is uh, an elegiac poem with a difference. We looked into some passages from this poem and analyzed read the poem with reference to poetic devices, thematic contrast rhyme rhythm meter and then finally offered two readings one is syntactic reading actually the reference is called syntax of death it is a very interesting article I would suggest you to read it you can see that reference just now you can see that. Then we have this post structuralist reading from Bygrave saying that Gray implicates in his own irony and he denies the immortality that he talks about. Here are the references particularly the one on Hutchings I enjoy reading much more syntax of death instability in grace elegy written in a country churchyard. Hope you too enjoy reading about the syntax of death in grace poem elegy. Thank you.